tonight, we're going we're gonna to talk about telling God's story, right? Because when you share your faith, your faith is not just how, what God has done in you. Your faith is what God has done. So you got to learn how to tell God's story. You got to learn how to tell your story. And then you got to learn to tell the world your st- or God's story and your story. And, and those are really the three messages we're going to be looking at. And in the last message, I'm hoping to actually get some of you to teach on Sunday nights by sharing your message, uh, by sharing your story. So this could be very exciting or it could be a disaster, but it's going to be awesome. Um, so let's jump right in. I'm going to list out a bunch of movies for you. Avatar, Lord of the Rings trilogy, Twilight Saga, Inception, best movie ever, Harry Potter series, and The Hunger Games. These movies are among the top 10 biggest grossing movies in the last few years. They made the most money in theaters. Now, let me ask you this. What do all these movies have in common? What do they all have in common? Magic. Magic, yeah. All right, let's let's, let's throw out the common things they have in common. Magic, all right, let's agree. They all have some serious animation, right? The graphics are just amazing. I mean, the the acting, it ain't bad, right? Come on. Some of these, they got some good acting in here. Um, But the reason we love all these movies, I would propose is this. Each one of them is a great story. Isn't it? Come on. How many of you guys saw Inception? How many of you guys at the end of it were like, oh! No? Okay, no, that was me. <laughs> right? I'm like, what? Is he going, right? All of these movies I would propose are all they're phenomenal stories. Like, take away the animation, all the explosion. At the heart of it is just really great stories. I think you and I, we love and are fascinated by stories, whether it's a big budget motion picture on an IMAX screen or, or it's a story that your friend tells you about what happened that night that you guys went out to the corn maze in the middle of the night, right? Like, like your friend comes and tells you, dude, I got to tell you what happened last night. There's something exciting about stories. And, and you know, and here's what I've noticed when I'm preaching. Oftentimes, here's from my perspective what I see. I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching, and people are like, notes, texting, sleeping. I see you, right? Uh, <laughs> people are doing things, right? But then here's what I've noticed consistently. When I get to a point in my sermon where I begin telling a story, every head turns up. That's from my perspective, just so you, that's, that's why, as I, as a preacher, see, pe- stories engage people. And I think the reason it does that is because it, 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 it captivates our minds, it stirs our, our imaginations for what could be. Bill Hybels, who is pastor of a large church in Willow Creek, has written a book called Just Walk Across the Room guaranteed awesome read. You would love it if you read it. But in it, he says this about stories. He says, stories captivates, captivate us with characters who seem so much like us. Plot lines that give us fresh eyes to see life around us. Vivid descriptions of parts of the world we've never visited. And probing questions that force us to declare what we really believe. And boy, that's so true, right? You see some movies and you're like, wow, what would life look like, be like if I existed in that place? What would it be like if my story was their story? I think he's right on the money with that. Now, in studying movies, and and I'm a huge movie buff. I love stories. I love movies. Here's what I've come to observe, or here's what I've uncovered. Every great story has four elements that make up the story. And you'll find this true to be in every story. Four elements that make up every great story. Let me walk you through them. One, One of the first elements that make up any great story is just compelling characters, whether it's an individual, a person, or an object compelling characters that the viewer wants to root for. You'll find that in every movie. This individual or object has to be so compelling that their very existence invites you as a viewer to join in their story, which keeps you turning page to page, right? It's all about the character. And so, um, Lord of the Rings, Frodo Baggins, compelling character, right? And I think you and I are joining Frodo Baggins. We like him because he is this little hobbit in a world of giant men and orcs and, and uh, all these um, orcs and wizards and all these other beings that he really should not survive. And so we're drawn into Frodo's character, into his story. Um, in the movie Hunger Games, Katniss Everdeen is a chick in a man's world where it's primarily dominated by men, this Hunger Games. She should be the underdog. And so already we root for her because there's something compelling about her. We want her to win. And you'll find this in every good movie that you've watched. There is a main character there, so compelling, that's likable, or at least has some redeeming qualities in it. 
Um, I think about the movie Cast Away with Tom Hanks, right? Tom Hanks is the main character, but who's the co-star? Wilson, right? It's not even a person. It's a ball, but we're, we're dr- when Wilson dies, how many of you guys went in the theater? Aw, right? We're drawn into their story. All right, so movies, first element, compelling character. Second element in every great movie is inciting action. Not exciting, inciting action. And, and so here's what I mean by that. Something profound happens to the main character that sets the whole movie in motion, right? Otherwise, you don't have a movie. Something happens to the character that causes them to have activity. Uh, And so let's go Inception, awesome movie. The main character, Cobb, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, is a dream architect who infiltrates people's dreams and steals their ideas. They call it extraction. It's stealing, all right? They steal people's ideas, right? So in this movie, after he's being falsely accused of murdering his wife, he has to run out of town. However, he's approached by an investor who says, listen, I have a way for you to be reunited with your kids. I'm going to offer you this deal for you to do this huge work, and you can come back. Well, that's the inciting action, right? That proposal that he should do this job is the inciting action. And really, everything else that happens in the movie Inception, all the explosions and the cool animation, it's all driven by that, right? What does Leonardo uh, Cobb want in the movie? He wants to go back home. So every movie has an inciting action, something that sets the character in motion that begins the action of the movie. Number three, every good movie has epic conflict. (laughs) Every good movie has an epic conflict conflict. It's quite simple. The main character wants something, but he has to face an obstacle to get it. And this obstacle might or might not cost him his life. It's that simple. You'll find this true to be every movie. Um, Harry Potter has to battle Lord, uh, Lord Voldemort to keep the world safe from evil. Uh, some of you guys here at the Remix when they go see the movie with Liam Neeson, uh, Nielsen um, taken. Right? And in that movie, Liam Neeson's character has to fight an army of killers to ensure the safe return of his family. In the movie Avatar, the main character, Jake Sully, ends up fighting against his own army in order to protect the land of blue-skinned people called Navi. There is an obstacle that the main character has to work through that you and I kind of want him to win, right? There's something that's in his way of what he's going to achieve. In fact, the epic conflicts that the main character faces is what usually gives us some of the best scenes in every movie that we see. And last but not least, in every great movie, not only is there a compelling character, not only is there inciting action, not only is there epic conflict, but there is a sense of hopeful resolution. Every movie needs this. If the movie doesn't have this, it's not going to sell. You need hopeful resolution. It doesn't have to end happily ever after. But the main conflict of the story needs to be resolved by the end of the story. So let's work through a few movies. Frodo Baggins, he has to destroy the ring, right? That's, he destroys the ring. That's the resolution of Lord of the Rings. Um, Cobb, in the movie Inception, ends up going home, or at least we're led to believe that he ends up going home. Um, my favorite movie of all time, Braveheart. Everyone, have everyone seen Braveheart, right? The end, it's a weird conclusion, like, because the main character dies. But what happens? His death motivates the army to rise up. And after 40 days and 40 nights, the sons of Scotland won their freedom. Best scene ever. Love the ending of Braveheart. Every movie needs these four elements. Compelling character, inciting action, epic conflict, hopeful resolution. Now, here's why these four things are important for you to know. It's important for you to know these four areas of a story because... These four elements are present in the story of the gospel. They're present in the story of God. In the gospel, the story of God, you will find a compelling character, inciting action, epic conflict, hopeful resolution. In fact, here's what's amazing about the story of God. Your personal story, the story of your birth, your salvation, and your life right now is intertwined into God's story. You are a character in God's story. And so, once again, tonight, the goal is, I want to help you guys understand how to tell God's story for that moment, for that moment when a friend of yours comes up to you and says, or ask a question along these lines, why are you so into God? You know, non-Christians are not going to come and ask you, tell me why it is you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
They'll ask you some form of that question. It might sometimes come across as what I just asked you. Why are you so into God? Why do you believe God is the real deal? How many of you guys ever found yourself in a situation where you weren't explicitly asked, but you found yourself presented with an opportunity to talk about your faith in some form, shape, or way? They didn't ask you explicitly, but all of a sudden it's like, wait, this is a chance for me to spread it. And perhaps you froze up a little bit. I'll be honest, I've been there. And so what I want to do tonight is help you understand through the framework of these four elements how to tell God's story. So let's start again from the top. Compelling characters. Um, uh, compelling characters. In the story of God, who's the most compelling character? It's an easy one. Who's the most compelling character in the story of God? God. There you go. That was an easy one. The answer wasn't the question, right? And now, what is it that makes God the most interesting, compelling character in this story? I'll give it to you. It's in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 20, 31. If you have your Bible, this might be helpful to open and follow along. Um, if you don't have a Bible, just listen up. I'll read it for you. But um, the Apostle Paul gives perhaps the most descriptive answer as to why God is the most compelling character. And by the way, when we're done, I'm going to have you guys share this story with each other. So you might want to pay attention because it'll be good for you to pass later. All right, so stick with me here. And don't run out, okay? Andrew's by the door. He's got a guitar. He will play music if you try to run out the door. Um, with that weird. Um, anyway, um, Acts chapter 17. That was supposed to be a compliment, Andrew. I don't think it was... It, there. Yeah. Okay. Acts 17, 24 says this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, God himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So, the most compelling character in the story of God is God himself. And so when you find yourself presented with an opportunity to talk about the story of God, to share your faith, might I encourage you to include the part about God not only being the creator of everything, but God also being the one who gives everything the ability to create. Did you catch that? God not only creates everything, but he gives everything, or at least humans, the ability and living things, the ability to create. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Let me give you an example. Um, God does not only create man and give him the ability to be a chef or a baker, but God is the one who creates the seed that becomes a grain, which is grounded in the flour to make dough that becomes a cake. So he not only gives you the ability to create, but he creates the thing that you end up using to create what you create. Are you with me so far? You and I are limited in the things that we can create from scratch. In other words, how many of you guys ever walk into your kitchen on a Saturday evening, you're hungry, and you walk into your kitchen and just say, hot wings, and it appears. How many of you guys ever had that? That would be awesome, wouldn't it? But we can't do that, right? Uh, first of all, the chicken has to be born, then it has to be killed, then it has to be chopped up, then it has to be cleaned up, then it has to be seasoned, then it has to be frozen and packaged and put on the store shelf, then you got to go get it and put it in the oven and it's warmed up and then you have the meal. Are you with me so far? You, you can't just make stuff out of nothing. God, on the other hand, makes anything he wants, as much as he wants, when he wants, however he wants. He's the only one in creation who can say, hot wings. <laughs> and we got hot wings. And so when you speak about God being a creator, when someone asks you about your faith, you got to start with God. That the God I follow is the creator of everything. He's not only the creator of everything, but the God I follow also gives us the ability to create. Are you with me so far? You start with God. But then in your story, you got to move to the second part, which is inciting action inciting action. Read with me Acts 17 verse 26 to 28 and see how God incites action. It says, we're continuing from the same passage we were reading, verse 26, from one man God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and God marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. 
God did this so that man would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live, move, and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So, homework time, assignment time. Based on this reading that I just gave to you, anybody in here want to take a stab at what the inciting action is that sets God's story into motion? We already know God exists. He's a creator God. He says, let there be light. He says, let there be man. He creates man from the ground, right, with his hands, breathes life into him. And then this passage goes on to explain what happens after that. So anybody want to take a stab at what, what's the inciting action here? Anyone, anyone got it? Here's a candy bar in it for you. It's not on me right now, but I will get it for you. Purple. That's good. That's good. But there's a little bit more. What is the, what is the, what is, that's good. That's good. I'll give you that. Okay. But there are some specific actions in that passage I just read. I'm gonna help you out again. Let me read it to you again. From one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Whole earth. It's actually more than one inciting action. God created, uh, from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. What's the inciting action? Give me one. You got it. You got it. Go ahead. Just throw it out. There's no wrong answer. There is, but I'll just let it go. Yes, Lindsay. Okay, okay. So, so he, he creates mankind to inhabit the earth. Right? That's an inciting action. He sets things in motion. What else is there? What else do you see? What else do you guys see? How, how about this one? The fact that before God ever creates mankind, think about the beauty of this and the wisdom of this. Before God creates mankind, what does he do to prepare the way for mankind? He, he builds a home for mankind. Like man did not come and then God create earth. God created earth and then within earth, this beautiful planet, God creates a garden. And then he creates man. That, that's, that's, he incites action. He starts off this process. Not only that, then he creates man. And I love this part, guys. This is encouraging. Uh, God looks at man and says, you know what? It's not good for you to be lonely. I'm going to hook you up with a fine girl, okay? He creates Eve from man. Okay, is that inciting action, right? Does he say, well, by creating Eve, what does he do? He, what's that? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, exactly, right? He, he, he sets in motion humanity. Are you with me so far? Are you, are you getting it? He sets in motion humanity. And then what, what else does he, does he do? Mama said it. She said purpose. But specifically, the passage says God appoints times seasons and, and geographical locations for mankind to live in. In other words, God appoints purpose. When telling the story of God, it's important that you not only communicate that God is the creator of everything who creates the ability to create, right? So, so get this, if you are a scientifically minded, you didn't come up with that. There's a reason why some of us are numbers people and others are not. Let me clarify. There's a reason why some of you are numbers people and some of us are not, okay, because I'm not a numbers person. Uh, and some of us are more artistic, and some of you don't get art, right? That's not a bad thing. That's because God says, when I created you, I created you with the ability to create. And some of you guys have a different flavor of creation, right? Some of you get artistic. Some of you are numbers people. Some of you are, are, are you're more expressive, right? different people. Well, the second part of it is that God not only created you and gave you design and purpose and all of that, but he sets time. So let me give you an example by listing out or walking you through the life of a fictional character named John. This is John. Meet John. Say what's up, John. It's a bad boy right there. Right? It's a cool looking dude. I like John. John's cool. Let me tell you about John. For example, prior to John being born, here's what God did. Inciting action, giving him purpose. God plots out John's life before John is ever born. God says John will be born in the 21st century. Not the 1st century, not the 13th century. John will be born in the 21st century. John will be born in Morristown, New Jersey, June 19th. John's going to be Hispanic, and John will be introverted and thoughtful. God says, I'm going to give John 89 years of life. And in that period of time, I will bless him with a sharp mind and the ability to tell great stories. He will be skilled with pen and he will write epic tales. He's going to be an author. And when God says that, God says, go. 
And when God says go, here's what happens. <clears throat> on earth, a woman pees on a stick. And after she's done peeing on a stick, stick with me, she goes to her husband and says, guess what? <laughs> We're having a baby. And I'd like to call him John. Okay, maybe I have to get too far with the peeing on the stick, right? But you get my point. You get my point, right? Are you with me on that? Right? Inciting action. My wife said, don't share that. I'm like, it's too awesome. I got to share that. By the way, that's how we found out. She peed on the stick and told me you were having a boy, right? But, but, but get this. God appoints. Let me read it to you again. Just, I, I want you to hear it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not. Acts 17, verse 26. From one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. You are here today by God's design. And you may pack up and be like, I'm done with Jersey. That's fine. Wherever you end up is by God's design. And some of us have tried to run out of Jersey, and God brings us back to Jersey. <laughs> And God says, it's all part of the plan, baby. Now, just to be clear, there's probably a lot more that goes into planning our lives than what I just described, <laughs> right? But in some sense, God sets humanity into motion with that goal. And, and by the way, verse 27, it's not just the fact that God creates and sets things into motion. What's the end goal of God setting things in motion? It's not just about where we live or what we do. Someone look up verse 27 so that in pursuing our purpose in life, we would find the one who gave us purpose. So, so here's the deal. No matter what your desire, ambition, and pursuits are, God gave that to you so you would pursue him. So whether you are a driver or a fashion designer or you're a mathematician or a restaurant owner, or perhaps you work with your hand. Whatever it is that you do, God says in pursuing these ambitions in life, it's designed to point you back to me. Are you with me on that? So that when you share your faith with your friends, you not only talk about God being the creator, you not only talk about purpose, but you help them see that the very things that you're pursuing in life is designed by God to lead you back to him. Are you with me so far? Inciting action. Maybe that's too much, but you get the point. That's the second part. Now the third part, let's go there. Here it is. Um, epic conflict, right? God creates, God incites action, but there's an epic conflict. And the epic conflict is this. Things haven't worked out as they should, have they? We know from scriptures that sin entered the picture when the first woman and man sinned, disobeyed God. They did what God instructed them not to do. And by the way, if you've ever looked at Adam and Eve and thought to yourself, man, they messed it up for all of us. I should point out that you and I continue that cycle that Adam and Eve begin every moment when we disobey God, whether it's in our thought or in our action. In other words, if you and I had been in the garden, guess what? It had done exactly the same thing. If you've ever looked at a girl and been like, man, Eve messed it up for all of us. Oh, uh, no, we repeat that pattern. If we were in Adam and Eve's shoes, we would have done the same thing. Ladies, you would have probably given in to the mind games that the serpent played on Eve. Guys, if you were in that garden, you would have given in to Eve's offer. Same thing, we would have done it. And so we sin. It's created a rip in our relationship for us and God. Now, here's what I know to be true. When it comes to sharing your faith with people, one of the hardest parts of sharing our faith with people who ask us about it is when it comes to sin, right? I mean, you and I want to talk about God's love and God's favor and God's blessing and how God's going to, you know, just trust in Jesus Christ. And we, we sometimes find it hard to present the fact about sin. And I was thinking about this. It, to tell someone about Jesus Christ without talking about the epic conflict, without talking about sin, is to tell them a half story. Now, let me put it this way. How epic a story would Lord of the Rings have been if King Isildur, at the very beginning, simply had just thrown the ring in the fires of Mordor. Like, like if this had happened, remember that scene in Lord of the Rings where they were both at the beginning, and King Isildur will not throw the ring in the fire, he takes it? What happened if this dude simply just, you know, fired an arrow at him? We wouldn't have a story, right? If we said, you know, I'm not going to tell this hard part. We have to tell the hard part. So, so here it is. We can go to the next slide. According to the passage we are reading tonight, the greatest sin that you and I can commit or have committed or that anyone commits 
is really this. It's the fact that we reduce God to a deity that we are most comfortable with. I think many people often treat God, including us sometimes, we treat God like an item on the dollar menu. And here's what we do. We, we kind of take a God of our own choosing. We go on the dollar menu and we say, well, I'll take a God with some love. No judgment, hold the hell, throw in some occasional blessing and a large side of answered prayers. We want nothing to do with God's judgment. That's what verse 29 says when it says, therefore, we are God's offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In fact, verse 30 goes on to tell us where the conflict comes in. It says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So whether we like it or not, whether we ignore it or not, a day is coming where God will judge the world. And here it is. When it comes to sharing your friends about sin, here's the reality. Of what, here's the way you want to present it. Right? Perhaps you're feeling like, I feel kind of hypocritical talking about sin. Maybe you present it this way. Help them see, and you should know this, that someday everyone, Christian and non-Christian, everyone will someday give an account for their lives. Every evil person in history will give an account for their lives. Every person who thinks they're not evil in history will give an account for their lives. Get this, every holy person will give an account for their lives. And for many people on the day when you stand before God and you give an account for your lives, for some it's going to result in bitter weeping, as the Bible described it, gnashing of teeth. You know what it takes to gnash your teeth? A deep sense of pain, <clears throat> hurt, disappointment. For others, it's going to result in celebration. And you know what will make the difference? What will make the difference is the next point, hopeful resolution. Are you guys, in some sense, getting how to present the gospel? Right? So, so in, in explaining to your friend that, listen, it's this simple, whether you acknowledge sin or not, you, we're going to give an account for our lives someday. Everyone will give an account. And what will make a difference on the day when we give an account for our lives is what is the last part of our element of story, and that's hopeful resolution. And it's the fact that... Um, it's, it's uh, the hopeful resolution is Jesus Christ. Let's just call it what it is, right? God sends Jesus Christ, right? So the epic conflict is that you and I have sinned. Sin has separated us from God. We will give an account for our lives. And if we fall short, if we fall, if we are one less, one this much less holy than God, right? Because scripture says, God says, you need to be holy as I'm holy. God says that about himself, which is virtually impossible. God, God's, when God says, be holy as I'm holy, he's essentially letting you know, you can't do it. You need someone to help you do it. And so when presenting your faith, right, I, once again, I'm not t giving you the mechanics of sharing your faith. I'm kind of giving you a big picture because he here's the fact of the matter. I, I can't give you a system on how to share your faith because it's different with everyone, right? Uh, I might meet somebody who thinks that they are good person. They live their lives good, and so they deserve to, be, they deserve, uh, uh, to go to heaven. When I'm sharing my faith with that person, I'm not going to focus on the mercy of God and the patience of God and the grace of God. I'm going to help. I'm going to go where they go and I'm going to say, okay, you think you're good enough? And I'm going, to, I'm going to help them see that, in fact, they are not good enough. I'm going to show them how holy compared to who? If you claim to be a holy, a good person, compared to who? Would you, compared to uh, Mother Teresa, would you consider yourself holy? And in some sense, with that specific type of person, I want to help them see that they truly do not. They are not as holy as they think they are. However, if I'm speaking to somebody who comes up to me with a recognition that they are broken, separated from God, I'm not going to talk to them about the judgment of God. I'm going to talk about the mercy of God because they've come to me because the Holy Spirit's already been working on them. Are, are you with me? I'm trying to make the point that different people require a different approach. And so you need to understand the big story in order to filter it into this story. Did, did you get that? Okay, so Jesus, God sends Jesus Christ to bridge this gap between us and God, right? We're going to stand before God Sunday, give an account for our lives. Many of us realize that we fail woefully in God's presence, and it could result in judgment. But in that moment, at the center of God's plan, the only person we have on our side who can save us from our sins is Jesus Christ. God sends Jesus Christ to absorb God's anger at our sin. 
God's a holy God. We're not. God says the only way that you can come before me is if somebody else comes on your behalf. And the only person worthy in all of creation to come before me on your behalf is Jesus Christ. And so through Christ, here's what God is saying. Let me read it to you. It's as if God is saying, listen, give up trying to do good things to earn your way into my grace. You will never be able to earn enough brownie points to get my grace. Your bad outweighs your good. And even your good are filled with wrong motives. Give it up. Let me share with you a better plan. My son, Jesus Christ, is the only one in all of creation, all of eternity, I'm sorry, who can plead your cause in my presence. Jesus, my son, has earned the right because he willingly laid his life on your behalf when someone needed to bear the brunt of my anger at humanity's sin. So now, if you have anything to say, here's God speaking. So now, if you have anything to say or ask from me, you can only do it through Jesus Christ because he, because he alone has my full attention. Uh, let me step back a little bit. I'm not saying this is exactly what you're going to share with your friends. I'm simply trying to tell you the big story, and, and I'll filter it down for you in a moment here. The good news and the hopeful resolution is that Jesus Christ himself is the happily ever after of God's story. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Next week, we're going to look at how to share your individual stories. But tonight, here's what I want to do. I want to give you two challenges. Two challenges. Quite, quite simple. And, and, and we're going to end a little differently tonight. I was actually going to have you guys come up and ask questions. We're not going to do that. I'm going to give you a chance. So here's the first thing I want you to do. Get my sheet because it's huge. Two things. I'm going to tell you, give you an assignment for this week, and then I'm going to actually have you practice it. So there's two assignments. Number one, between now, tonight, and Easter, this year, that's 12 weeks away. Here's what I want you to do. I want to challenge you to share God's story that I just explained to you with one person. How many of your heart rates just went up? <laughs> Between now and Easter, share God's story with one person. I don't care who it is. It could be a family member, a friend. Just make sure they're not a dud. In other words, don't go share it with another Christian, all right? Share it with a non-Christian. That's the challenge. When I say dud, I'm talking about Christians. I mean it in a nice way, right? <laughs> right? Share it with a non-Christian. Perhaps work your way into that conversation. I'm not saying just go bust out, start sharing, right? Work your way into that relationship, all right? If you're close, let it naturally get there. But you have 12 weeks to put this challenge to practice. One person. One, that's not a lot, is it? 12 weeks, one person? Come on. Some of us haven't shared the gospel with anyone in our lives. One person, the next 12 weeks. Tell them about the compelling character, God. Tell them about the inciting action, right? Compelling character, God, who creates inciting action, right? He uh, gives us purpose, time, right? Uh, talk about the epic conflict, how sin has separated us, and we have to give an account for our lives. And then tell them about the hope for resolution, which is Jesus Christ. One person between now and Easter. I'm not going to check up with you, but I want you to do that. Here's the second challenge. Challenge number two. And this is not an option to number one. This is an addition to number one. Between now and Easter, I want you to invite one friend to church. Between now and Easter, invite one friend to church where they can come hear God's story. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying invite them to remix. That would be great. I'm saying whatever church you go to, I don't care where you go to, right? Not all of you go to Grace Church. Now, I say remix, obviously, because we're young adult ministry, so if you're going to invite a friend, it's a young adult you're inviting here. But it could be Sunday morning, it could be Sunday night. Um, invite one person. How many of you guys ever invited someone to church that actually came? Okay, this should be easy then. This one is easier than the first. You guys up for this challenge? Are you? Be honest. One person between now and Easter. Tell them God's story. And then invite, it could be the same person, it could be someone else. Oh, let me clarify this. Um, sending them an email and leaving a message on their Facebook page does not count. Okay? Now, now you can do that in addition to inviting them face-to-face, -face, right? So you're allowed to, you can put it on their Facebook page, but you need to follow up with them by saying, hey, let me, you know, if, if the conversation leads there, you tell them a God story or, or, I'm sorry, in addition, invite them to church. Are we cool?